A reading from Isaiah. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Word of God, word of life. seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Oh God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Oh God, you're my God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. For your steadfast love is better than life itself, my lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live and lift up my hands in your name. Oh God, eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My spirit is content as with the richest of foods, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My whole being clings to you, your right hand holds me fast. Oh God, eagerly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. A reading from 1 Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. 
for they drank for the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we may not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as, did, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of us did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to, to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Word of Christ, word of life. I invite the children to come forward this time. Have a seat. <clears throat> I have some things to show you today. Everybody find a seat. <clears throat> All right, I have some things to worship today. Things that we're going to bow down and worship, okay? First thing is a baseball. What do you think? Shall we bow down and worship the baseball? Probably a bad idea, huh? Even though it's signed by Ed. Whoever that is, we don't even know who that is. How about, I know, the United States Military Academy, West Point. That means it's about the army. Should we, should we bow down and worship the army? No, that's not a good idea either, okay. How about big books, getting really smart, knowledge? Should we bow down and worship a big book? No. No, that's not a good idea either. Horrible idea. Okay, now this has a word on it. Can you make it out? Jesus. It says Jesus on it. Yeah, how about that? A friend of mine made that for me. What do you suppose? Should we bow down and worship Jesus? Yeah. Yes. Now, what's the difference between these things and Jesus? What's the difference? Is maybe Jesus is actually worthy of worship. Maybe Jesus can actually help us and bless us like other things can't. Today, the lesson is about watching what it is that you worship and making sure that we worship things, the real thing, which is God, right? And not get that mixed up. I'm having a nummy candy. You're having a nummy candy. That's good to know. So, you listen carefully today about what that means, okay? If your parents fall asleep, just give them a nudge, like that, okay? Thanks for coming up today. Let us rise for the Lenten verse. Gospel according to St. Luke. 
At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you also will perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? But he replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, how we thank you for this season of renewal, this season of repentance, this season when we reflect once again on the cross, on the call of discipleship. Today, Lord, we pray especially that you would help us as we reflect on our objects of worship. We pray, God, that you would lead us to yourself, to the true and living God, the one who gives life. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Dearly beloved of God, today we are going to do something a bit different. We are going to reflect on idolatry in our lives. That's right, idolatry. Now I know that not many of you have personal gods that you worship in your home on a regular basis. But that's not what we're talking about, of course. We are talking about idolatry as defined by our Lutheran forebearer, Martin Luther. Here's what he says. Idolatry does not consist merely in the act of erecting an image and praying to it. It consists chiefly in the state of a heart that is intent on something other than God. Or most succinctly, Luther says, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is your God. Whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is your God. Now the occasion for this reflection on idolatry is the appointment of Second, or 1 Corinthians 10 as our lesson, second lesson for today. And in this passage, Paul is warning his congregation about what can happen when the people of God become complacent in regards to idolatry. So I invite you to find a pew Bible in front of you because we're going to look at this passage with some detail today. Uh, it's found on page 931. 931. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Now we're going to begin in the con. So I want to show you the context of this argument, which begins in chapter 8, big number 8 on ni page 930. Um, because there's a specific issue that Paul's concerned about. If you'll, re if you'll refer to the bottom of page 930, big number eight, verse four. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, 
We know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Here's the crux of the situation. The members of Paul's congregation in Corinth are living in a thoroughly pagan culture. And as part of this culture, there are temples in all the cities. And festivities and feasts of the culture are held in these pagan temples where food that has been sacrificed to idols is part of the menu. And of course, these early believers, having grown up in this culture, do not want to be left behind and not be able to celebrate and the regular festivities with their friends. And so they argue that they have a special knowledge which protects them from idolatry. And this is what they said. We know that no idol exists or no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. They said, we understand that there's only one true God and that these idols are merely images of stone and wood. We are in no spiritual danger by participating in these rituals. That would be a little bit like us saying, we are solid members of Mount Olive Lutheran Church, and therefore we can go to the meeting of the local cult on a regular basis and have no concerns because we have a special knowledge about who the true God is and who it is not. Well, I might be a little nervous about that if you said that, and Paul's a little nervous about the Corinthians. So he reminds them that idolatry is not something that they should play around with. Now I'll go to the top of page 931. His first argument in this, this is still chapter 8, verse 7. It is not everyone, whoever, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Paul reminds the Corinthians that while some of them may have this knowledge, others are not able to make these distinctions and may be drawn into sin. He says, be careful. Be careful that you think that all are on the same plane, for not all have this special knowledge. Then he goes on in chapter 9. He has another um, concern. And you could find it where, let's see, he says on the top of 931, the right-hand column, he's talking about freedom. Basically says in the first part of this ninth chapter, yes, you are free to do as you like as Christians. You are free. But look what he says, top of 931. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He's saying, yes, it's true. As followers of Jesus, you're free to live as you like. That's true. But remember that others may be drawn into problems because of your freedom. If by using your freedom you cause others to be drawn into sin or unbelief, that is an obstacle to the gospel. This could be an illustration I've often heard where, say a family member or a loved one in your concern is suffering with alcoholism and they just got out of treatment and they come to your Christmas party. And maybe you decide as loved ones that that year you are not going to have alcohol at the celebration out of love for your friend or your loved one who's just gotten out of treatment, lest you provide an obstacle to the gospel. In other words, lest you cause a relapse. Your freedom is constricted by love. And so Paul is saying here, yes, you are free to attend the festivities in the temple, but consider how your fellow members are affected by your freedom. Well, then finally in chapter 10, 
Our passage for today, Paul really lays out his concern, his main concern. He says, bottom of 931, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now, I know this is cryptic language, but Paul here is referring to the Exodus and the wandering in the wilderness. He reminds the, Cor uh, the Corinthians that the Israelites traveled through from Egypt into the promised land with the cloud of God over them, presence of God, the evidence of God's presence, and also that God led them to the sea, rescued them from Pharaoh's army, through the water, saved them from death. God also provided manna, spiritual food, and water in the wilderness. He said, God provided all these things, and yet God was not pleased with most of them. God was not pleased with most of them. Paul is doing this because he wants the Corinthians under, to understand that they are very much in the same way. He said, you too live under the cloud of God, the spirit of God given to you at baptism. You too were brought through the waters of baptism and saved from death. You too have been given spiritual food and drink, the body and blood of Christ. You too could be at risk of not being in God's pleasure. For he says, all of these gifts were given to the Israelites, and yet God was not pleased with them. And why was not God not pleased with them? And then he gives this litany of sins, and if we look carefully at that, we see that they all revolve around one activity, and that was the activity of idolatry. The activity of idolatry. God, or Paul says, do not live as some of them did, for God will not be pleased with you. And finally he says, if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. I think these are important words for us today. We, too, live in an increasingly secularized culture, as you know. And there are many, many things that vie for our attention, that vie to be idols in our life. Sports, knowledge, wealth, power, all sorts of things vie to be the idol of our life, the thing that we spend our time, our money, and concern on. Now we might say, yes, 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 we know this, but we have a special knowledge. We know who the true God is, and we know who the false gods are. We are protected from idolatry by our special knowledge. And Paul says, be careful, be careful, because the temptations of this world are powerful and can draw you away from the true God without you even knowing it. Be careful that you think that you stand and all of a sudden you're falling. Whereas Luther might say, be careful what your heart clings to and confides in, for that is truly your God. This Sunday in the bulletin cover, I have put an image that I found of a golden calf. You, of course, remember the golden calf from the Israelite story. This artist has drawn the golden calf with some 
um, shall we say, some possible idols in our culture. You can see what they all are. None of these things are inherently evil, but all of them can get out of whack where suddenly it is all we care about. And the question would be, are any of these things things that are where your time and your money and your primary concern continually lands? If there are anything that is out of whack, it may be that in this season of repentance, idolatry is something you need to consider repenting of. It is the business of substituting that which is not God for the true God. It is a very important consideration. But I want you to leave you with these words as promised from Isaiah. The prophet says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and then righteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God's promise is clear. When we come to God in repentance, God always hears and forgives and draws us back into his embrace. For our God is a God of life and peace and joy, the God who brings us finally all that we need. This is most certainly true. Amen.